America's number one selling vehicle, the Ford F-150, the tuner car hero, R35 GTR, and even the electric Tesla Model 3 are unanimously blockbuster hits. But then there are just some cars that automakers would just love for us to forget about. Ones that were only a V8 away from making a real dent in the automotive industry. Or were just a little too mischievous for their own good. Yeah, these are the four biggest sales flops, plus a dishonorable mention that you may have already forgotten about, but I'm here to remind you how bad things once were. Oh, and the last rig on this list, one look and you'll know exactly why it didn't make it. It's great to see you guys again. Let's go. Screw saving the best for last, we all knew that the Plymouth Prowler was going to make it on this list. And here it is in all of its retro styled glory. This modern day hot rod design that for some reason Chrysler thought we all needed felt like a parts bin special. First off, you guys remember this car? It's the Dodge Intrepid with the 3.5 liter V6. And guess what? That same underwhelming power plant can be found in the Prowler. Because nothing says muscle car like a V6. Plus. On the interior, the door handles are from the Viper, as well as the gauges. All the HVAC controls are from the Dodge Neon. Even the plastic vents are pulled from the Town & Country minivan. It's just a mishmash of parts from a bunch of different cars. And all those other cars weren't that great either. Well, except the Viper, but another story for another day. And what was Chrysler thinking? Giving us a quote unquote muscle car with almost zero performance thanks to it only having 214 horsepower to play with and an antiquated slow shifting four speed automatic transmission. That sounds more like a recipe for disaster. Muscle cars are all about going fast and the fun of driving. The Prowler wasn't about either of those. Now the Prowler was Chrysler's sad attempt to follow up the absolutely bonkers Dodge Viper. V10 power baby. And it really wasn't all bad. The Indy Racer style front wheels are a lot like nothing else. Plus, by mounting the transmission in the rear, facilitated a desirable 50-50 weight distribution. And a mid-cycle refresh to the engine gave the 3.5 liter high output 253 horses, which was higher than the Magnum V8 of the early 2000s. But the Prowler was pretty much dead on arrival. With only 11,702 willing to cough up the roughly $40,000 it took to get into this automotive flop, it's safe to say that Chrysler's expectations were here, and well, the Prowler was down, down here, like in the comments section. Miraculously though, there's still a market for them because the cheapest one I could find is still pushing 20 grand. Oh, and if you are tempted to buy one, there's one more thing. Those roll bar looking things behind the seats, well, they're just for looks. So if you're unfortunate enough to be in a rollover accident in this bathtub style jalopy, you are You'd think it'd be tough to do worse than the Prowler, but Pontiac wasn't done. Meet the Pontiac Aztec, probably the ugliest thing to ever sit on four wheels. This was one of the first mid-size crossovers to ever come to market. And it was hyped up by GM, but it ended up being one of the biggest failures in automotive history, which just doesn't make much sense, considering some of the best GM designers were working on this project, including this guy, Tom Peters, who was the director of exterior design for GM at the time. And this guy later on went on to design not just one, but two of Ideal Media's fan favorites, the In Your Face C6 Corvette and the Modern Marvel C7 Corvette. So how did Tom and his team let this monstrosity happen? Well, the main issue was no one designer had the final say. So the turn signals being completely separated from the headlights was one person's idea, while the two-tone paint with gray plastic moldings was another. Each in their own right were cool ideas, but mixed together on this shortened Pontiac Montana minivan platform and all you really get is an eyesore. Yeah, it's been said to be one of the ugliest vehicles to come out of Detroit. And your boys got to agree. But don't just take my word for it, because the public also seemed to agree. GM thought they could sell 75,000 Aztecs per year. And just, just to break even, they needed to produce 30,000 annually. But get this, 2002 was their best year and they only sold 27,793. And with an MSRP of 23 grand, yeah, 
no one seemed to buy them. And today, you can find one like this ugly duckling that's a bargain for just $550, or as low as $10 per month. And if it weren't for Walter White and the hit Breaking Bad TV series, which ended up causing a resurgence of interest in this ugly duckling, we probably would have forgotten about this hideous four-door crossover years ago. Oh, and one more thing. Doesn't the Aztec have a striking resemblance to the Cybertruck? Let us know up here. And while you're voting, it's time for the ideal question of the day, which is what is the worst car or truck or SUV that you've ever driven or ridden in? And why? Let us know down in the comments. I want to see your worst stories ever. Let's go. The Subaru SVX was how do I say this nicely? A different kind of sports car. SVX is an acronym for Subaru Vehicle X, and it was introduced at a time when the Japanese automaker was trying to find itself, which I'm still trying to do. And it had most of the iconic components that made a Subaru a Subaru. Confidence-inspiring all-wheel drive, a boxer motor that, even without a little turb ski, still managed to push out a remarkable 231 horsepower. Plus, Subaru hired design firm Ital Design, who produced incredible works of art like the BMW M1 and the oh-so-gorgeous Maserati Bora. And those stellar fellows designed the body of the SVX. A little here, cut a little there. Perfect. And although the slippery styling of the final product had a drag coefficient that would make supercars jealous, and an insane window in window design feature was something you'd only see in fighter jets, unfortunately, this fighter jet was no top gun for Subaru. And it's most likely because the direct competition for the SVX was the tech forward Mitsubishi 3000 GT VR4 and the classic but always relevant Porsche 911 Carrera 4. That is a tough crowd to say the least. The SVX just couldn't keep up with the competition. And it wasn't only due to its four speed slush box transmission, but its nosebleed MSRP of $24,000. Which nowadays you can snag one of these puppies for under three grand. But I don't know why you'd want to. It was a good effort, but realistically, this ultra slow selling Subi never had a fighting chance in the luxury and performance car market. Oh baby, and now it's time for that dishonorable mention. Hey you, do you remember how bad the Plymouth Prowler was? Well, its successor, the Chrysler Crossfire, wanted to one-up its older sibling. If you just close one eye and then squint with the other, no, seriously, do it, it'll help. You'll be able to see that the Crossfire is about 80% mid-2000s Mercedes-Benz SLK Roadster. Yeah, about four-fifths of the components used on the Chrysler's rear-wheel drive two-seat sports car are from Daimler-Benz. And it's a total bummer it didn't all come together because this thing had a ton of potential. First off, the Heartbeat is a Mercedes-Benz 3.2 liter V6 that managed a measly 250 horses, which isn't all that great. But if you opted for the SRT6 model, Chrysler slapped on a supercharger built by their friends at AMG, which was good for 330 tire shredding horsepowers. Yet Chrysler's German built flagship model was short-lived. One of the main reasons was its less than confidence inspiring recirculating ball steering system. Hello, sporty platforms are supposed to excel in the twisties and the Chrysler Crossfire was just never sure footed. Plus there was a gamut of mechanical, is gamut, does that mean huge? Oh, okay, huge. Plus, there was a huge amount of mechanical and electrical issues. And since it was essentially a German car in American clothing, Chrysler dealerships didn't have the tools necessary to fix the car when it was new. So turnaround times on repairs were extra long. Something Tesla owners know something about. And you can learn all about in our ideal video about five awful cars you'll regret owning, which you definitely need to check out. Thankfully, Chrysler put the Crossfire out of its misery after just five years. And I guess we can just chalk it up to one of Chrysler's many misfires. But with that all said, the nearly $50,000 MSRP supercharged 330 horse SRT6 is now getting to tempting prices. Unsure handling, drift car anyone? So if you'd like to learn how to snag an ideal car that's not the SRT6 for an ideal price the right way, check out the ideal car strategies. I got gotcha. you. I'm gonna dig into theory with you guys because in theory, 
The Chevrolet SSR made a lot of sense. In the early 2000s, pretty much every manufacturer was coming out with some sort of retro styled vehicle. Like the, and I can't believe I'm mentioning this car again, Plymouth Prowler, which was a nod to the ultra cool 32 Roadster. Oh, and the masterpiece known as the BMW Z8 Roadster, a contemporary play on this 508 Roadster, and Ford's, well, unique Thunderbird which was inspired by the classic 50s T-Bird. Chevy wanted to get into the retro game, and since they were selling a ton of pickup trucks, their knee-jerk reaction was this. A uh, hot-rodded convertible pickup truck slash sports car thing with a V8 shoehorned in under the hood for good measure. Hey, at least they got the engine right. Well, the second time. Yeah, the SSR, which stands for Super Sport Roadster, initially came with GM's 5.3 liter, 300 horsepower V8, which was lame to say the least. But only two years later, they replaced that engine with an engine that it should have come with from the start. The LS2, baby, a V8 with 395 horsepower from the C6 Corvette. And what's so cool is an optional six-speed manual was available. But even then, zero to 60 times were on par with a Nissan 350Z. So like five and a half seconds, which isn't that great. And what also wasn't that great was the interior. It was a truck with only two seats and it was a bit cramped for two full-grown adults. And if you wanted to use it like a pickup truck, Forget about it. It was just too much of a pickup for sports car enthusiasts and too much of a sports car for pickup folks. And the 40K plus starter price tag was more than most baby boomers were willing to throw down on this rig. And nowadays you can find them for about a quarter of their starting price. The Chevy SSR was an overpriced toy that most people in the car scene couldn't believe that Chevy built. And yet they did. And although only a few people bought them new, if you want a unique neckbreaker, the Chevy SS might be the ideal deal at this point. Wait, who are we kidding? Did you know for the same price, you could buy a Ferrari? Or check out what YouTube thinks you should watch next. Oh, and smash the like button if you like this video for the YouTube algorithm and subscribe. But either way, you can't lose and as always, keep living that ideal lifestyle.